Okay, this is a lecture on revolutionary thought. You should take notes on this. Um, and mostly what this is going to do is give us some context for the ways in which the um, colonists in North America respond to some of those solutions that we talked about in our last class to the problems that England is facing after the French and Indian War. So this is mostly context, and this is going to fit really nicely with what you guys have been learning in Econ Civ. So um, important place to start is with the Enlightenment. Ooh, which I have misspelled on this slide. See if you can spell it right at some point in class in the next week or so. Um, so the Enlightenment is a flowering of sort of political and social thought, um, mostly European, uh, that takes place between the years 1650 and about 1789, um, which is when the French Revolution begins. Um, the people during the Enlightenment... Um, mostly learned European men, um, felt that they could reform society through reason, through using their minds in order to apply logic to the problems of the world and solve the problems of the world. This is the same time period in which we get the scientific method that we use today in science classes, where you start with a hypothesis, you test your hypothesis, and you come to some sort of conclusion in order to solve a problem. Um, this also was a way for people to challenge some of the existing traditions of the time, particularly the idea of the church holding a lot of control in society. People start questioning God in a lot of ways because they're now using reason and logic to do that. And also questioning the idea of divine right, which European monarchs have used to sort of justify their power for centuries at this point. So a few major beliefs that we want to be aware of with the Enlightenment um, are that people have natural rights at birth. So the moment that you breathe earth in this, breathe the air in this, um, on this earth, you have some sort of rights that are accorded to your person. There's also an idea that religious tolerance is a good thing. Um, so this is uh, in stark contrast to maybe the Puritans who would have been settling in North America, the early part of this period. Um, the idea that there's not necessarily a right way to worship God because now people are questioning a lot of things about religion. And this also is a, a school of thought that's really going to support the ideas of democracy and republicanism. Not the political parties that we know today, but the idea that democracy is power by the people and that republicanism Republicanism is power um, through sort of representatives. So instead of every single person having a vote, you elect someone to represent your interests. So um, three really important concepts that I want to make sure we're clear on, and I think you probably know these already from Econ Civ. Um, the first is um, the idea that we live, or we used to live, in the state of nature, which was the natural state of man in the world without any sort of society or civilization, um, and that man's human nature at its most basic sort of form, for better or for worse, is this sort of exists in the state of nature. Okay, that's one thing. Um, the next thing is that, uh, that there's some sort of social contract that f people form when they come together to create some sort of society or civilization. So this is the theory of how people act once a society is established, and some sort of leader or group of leaders is now in charge. Um, the idea that you, you maybe give up some things from the state of nature, or you sacrifice some things from the state of nature as part of this social contract. You are in contract with other people. And then again, this idea of natural rights, this theory that at birth human beings already have some universal rights, and the three big ones that get talked about a, a lot are life, freedom, also known as liberty, and the idea of property. So the idea that you, no one should be able to take your life away from you or that you have a right to defend your life, that no one should be able to take your freedom away from you and that you have a right to defend your freedom, and basically no one should be able to take your stuff, right? So possessions are kind of a part of our natural state. This influences thinking about what society and what government should look like and what power should look like in society. So if we look at like the political spectrum during the Enlightenment, to the left-hand side here, we see people who maybe fall under what we would call a more liberal or humanistic approach to thinking about politics and power. Um, so liberalism and humanism are more aligned to the left end of the spectrum. Um, the right side of the spectrum is a little bit more conservative, maybe a little bit more traditionalist, um, people who are more interested in preserving the status quo. This also may sound similar to the political spectrum that exists today. Totally fair, totally fair. Um, it kind of starts at this time. 
And we have two thinkers that we need to talk about who exist at either end of the spectrum. So John Locke is at the left end of the spectrum. He is a liberal thinker. He is a humanist thinker. Um, he lives from 1632 to 1704, um, so right around the time uh, that England is um, really becoming very prosperous and successful in the North American colonies, um, but before the Seven Years' War. He has a couple key beliefs, which are probably, again, going to sound familiar to you. He believes that man is born as a tabula rasa, which means a blank slate. Um, so nothing is written in stone when man is born. Everything can kind of be redone. And he also believes that man is basically a social animal, that we like being with other people. We want to be surrounded by others who are like us. We don't necessarily want to be hermits living in a cave somewhere. He also believes that man gives up some rights or some freedoms for the good of society. So for Locke, when people form governments, they, they sacrifice some of their natural rights, right? You might have to give up a little bit of your freedom or maybe even a little bit of your property, but the idea is that you're giving it up to the greater good. So you can create a political system where more people are safer, more people's rights are more respected overall, even if you have to give up a little bit of your individual rights. So if that's why government exists, he also believes that government and, and the state, those are the same thing, government and the state, um, need to s serve society's interests. If they're not making sure that people's rights are protected, if they're not making sure that things are running smoothly and people are taking care of each other, then government should be changed. And if it is resistant to that change, government should be overthrown. This is a very controversial idea at this time. When kings are claiming that God's, God has given them power and that no one should be able to question that power, um, Locke, Locke's ideas are, are very threatening um, to people who have held power in Europe for a long time. So he has a very overall hopeful view of, of human nature. His counterpoint at the other end of the political spectrum, more on the conservative and more traditional side, is of course Thomas Hobbes, who has a much less positive view of human nature. He is an angry, cranky man uh, who does not think very highly of human beings. Um, he is living and writing a little bit before John Locke. Um, he's born in 1588. He dies in 1679. Um, so before the, the British colonies are, have really taken off in the way that they have during Locke's time. He's generally pessimistic about both the state of nature and the state of man. Um, where Locke saw the state of human nature kind of being a, a generally good thing, uh, Hobbes believes that we are governed by our self-interests and that we're naturally antisocial. We might like being around other people, but we maybe like to be around them because we want to like murder them and steal their things. Kind of a dark view of, of the world. He also believes that man needs to be controlled by the state so that there's not this chaos and pain and constant murder and death and threat um, that he, he believes is part of man's, uh, man's, man's nature, um, human nature. So governments exist for Hobbes, yes, to protect the greater good, but also because we're kind of terrible people. And the government um, is a higher power. It, it's maybe the closer to the ideal of what human beings should be like. So if that's the case, you can't overthrow the government, according to Hobbes. The state or the sovereign, um, so either a, a, a parliament or a king, um, rules absolutely. Their, their authority cannot be questioned. The government cannot be overthrown. Um, otherwise, we're plunged back into the state of nature where, according to Hobbes, everyone is trying to kill each other all the time. Um, so two very important thinkers. Um, and uh, their thoughts are really going to shape a lot of the ways in which um, political bodies like Parliament um, and some of the political bodies that are going to form in the United States as we begin to be, start becoming the United States are going to think about what, um, what their political system should look like. One other thing I want to point out here. Um, the English colonists, the Americans, soon to be Americans, would have been familiar with both of these thinkers at this time and would have had some conflicts that they were probably wrestling with as they underwent some of these new laws that England is passing after the French and Indian War. So on one hand, they're very influenced by the idea of the rights of mankind, those natural rights. Um, we'll see this crop up in a pamphlet called Common Sense, which is written by a man named Thomas Paine. We'll be reading that in class later this week. We already saw that a little bit in the Declaration of Independence 
Independence by Thomas Jefferson, where he talks about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, by which he really means property. And we'll also see this next week, or in the weeks ahead when we actually have formed a government, um, where women are actually using this idea of natural rights to kind of advocate for a little bit more power and a little bit more status um, in the political system. Abigail Adams, who's married to John Adams, who's, who will be one of the founding fathers of this country, writes her husband a letter while they're trying to figure out what the new government should look like, where she asks him to sort of remember the place of women in society, remember the ladies, um, and not relegate them to kind of this lower status when there's an opportunity to really give everybody in America equal access to these rights. So that's on one side of, of things. The other way that colonists are going to be thinking about um, these sort of political changes during this period is that they, they still think of themselves as Englishmen. And they have not just natural rights, but they also have English rights as citizens of the empire. Um, this goes back to the publication of a book called The Fundamental Laws of England by a, a, a um, British jurist named William Blackstone, where he goes all the way back to the Magna Carta, which was written in, in 1215, and sort of lays out the ways in which these rights have been established over time, including the earliest version of the Bill of Rights. So people are going to think about their natural rights maybe being taken away from them by England, but they're also going to think about their English rights being taken away from them. Um, some of the colonists also used these ideas to um, advocate not for independence, but for some sort of compromise between the American colonies and Great Britain. John Dickinson, who's also a member, um, kind of a founding father, um, writes a, a basically like a we're sorry letter to Great Britain called the Olive Branch Petition, sort of asking them to take us back, asking them to take our, our rights and ideas into consideration, and remember that the American colonists are their English brethren. Um, and that petition is rejected by the King of England. Um, the people who kind of most fall into this category where they, they really assert the idea that they have these English rights that should be respected are, are called the Loyalists, meaning that they are loyal to the British crown during the American Revolution. They don't want independence. They don't feel like that's the best way to protect their rights in the world. They think it's much better to be part of, continue being part of this empire, um, which has given them rights and freedoms for several hundreds of years at this point, um, and just sort of needs to be reminded of what its responsibilities are. We will talk about all of these things in the days and weeks ahead. Uh, make sure you have notes on this for class tomorrow, and I'll see you then.